the Michael Corbin interview. I mean, it's it's also curious how many people are dying as a result of uh, being involved in this case. Michael Corbin interview, two thousand uh, July eighteenth, two thousand five. Noreen claims that she was recently in contact with Paul Bishop, this supposed CIA asset. Does she also disclose that a month ago, the witness who from his bedroom window heard a car door slam and saw the Ford Fairmont speed away, this was PJ Smith, revealed that he actually saw a man, most likely Tony, shoot Johnny with a stun gun, then lift him into the car with the help of someone, most likely Paul Bonacci, who was in the back seat. References information she recently received and revealed on the Marty Stacy show that the West Des Moines police chief attended child sex parties in Omaha with Robert Wadman, and that shortly after publicizing it, the source of the information died. Noreen starts to elaborate that the West Des Moines police chief told the witness, P.J. Smith, not to reveal what he had seen to anybody. Does this sound like a legitimate inf- uh, investigation here? The May 22nd, 2008 blog talk radio interview, Noreen states that she, that witnesses noticed the man in the blue car had a brown manila envelope on the seat. She recants how the man in the blue car got flicked the dome lights before pulling away, just before another man who was described as quite tall, over six feet, came out of the trees between the two houses, describes how a witness who was in his bedroom, PJ Smith, heard a car pull up really quickly, looked out the window and saw Johnny being shot with a stun gun before the tall man, and someone who jumped out of the back seat loaded him into the car and it sped away through the stop sign, going on to say that the vehicle pulled into a side street some ways away from the Gosh home and transferred something long wrapped in a blanket, Johnny's body, from it to a van parked there. As recounted to private investigators by a man who got up early, heard a car running and looked out the window. Noreen says that when neighbors called about not getting their papers, waking up, John went out to search, came home within minutes after finding Johnny's wagon. She claims police took her sheet of written statements from witnesses who she'd contacted before the police even arrived. Noreen insists that Johnny stayed listed as a runaway for multiple months. She recalls the article published a couple weeks later about two girls from Des Moines. Noreen also mentions the lesser-known 1986 kidnapping of Mark Allen which she was first notified about by the NCMEC because it did not receive publicity. She says she took the ruling of Judge Warren Erbaum in Bonacci's 99 trial to the county attorney and West Des Moines police who refused to accept it. She mentioned how 25 years later, on the morning of August 27th, a Sunday, her birthday, a package was delivered with photos of Johnny bound, gagged, and looking drugged claims that a lab at the NCMEC confirmed the photos were taken in the 1980s and were of Johnny a couple months following his kidnapping, says she took the photos to the police, but someone else who received them took them to the media. She also describes getting more photographs, around 250, from a CD sent to her through the U.S. mail without a stamp, some of Johnny and some of other kids, and how the police never called her back about it. She says she called a programmer friend to examine the CD, who found the photos were being posted on a Russian website, got the passwords to different areas on the site, and gave her enough information to provide to the NCMEC, who had been trying to break into that website for a long time. Reports that the Russian website had 8 million photos of children from all over the world, according to Noreen. The photos of Johnny didn't appear on the Russian pedophile website until they were sent to her indicating someone had them in their private collection for a while. Wow, the Des Moines Register purportedly printed a statement from police admitting they never investigated the origin of the photographs. Wow. That's crazy. What else is curious, on a recent, more recent interview, Catherine April Waters, January 5th, 2017, She stated the NCMEC tried to set up a task force to investigate Johnny, Eugene, and Mark Allen's disappearances, but the West Des Moines police refused to cooperate. She claims that the police told Mark Allen's parents not to talk to the press about their son's abduction to avoid panicking the public, and also told them not to talk to Noreen because she was a troublemaker. 
ensuring that she didn't even find out about Mark Allen until recently when the NCMEC told her. Wow. Okay, here's another major mind shock. Noreen compliments Nick Bryant as doing an excellent job in his book about the Franklin scandal with no mention of their earlier falling out. She mentions that the West Des Moines police chief, referring to Orville Cooney, died of a heart attack just as her attorney was preparing a civil case against him. Says that much earlier she told the city council of her plans to file a $20 million lawsuit against the city for the police chief's negligence, leading them to conduct an emergency non-public council meeting in which they forced Cooney to resign. She then says that four months later, Cooney was arrested for stealing blank videotapes and Molly screws from Target. What? What? Wow. Okay, that's all insane. Now let's go back to the smoking gun posts for and against this theory. Marion number one says this. A repeated occurrence on Faded Out was that it only took one new piece of information to make her do a complete 180 on her beliefs when the evidence wasn't nearly strong enough to warrant it. To give a few examples, as soon as she interviewed Chris Berge, she accepted his story without reservations and revised her view of Johnny's activities that morning to match Chris's account, putting it above all other witnesses who actually gave their accounts back in 1982. In response to an early newspaper account stating that Leonard delivered Johnny's papers before coming home to report him missing to police, Sarah came up with a theory that this wasn't suspicious, but rather an indication that Leonard was just searching the neighborhood for Johnny. As soon as she interviewed Leonard, and he said that he immediately went home to have Noreen call the police, Sarah abandoned her prior theory and just accepted what Leonard told her. Yet she did absolutely nothing to resolve or even acknowledge these contradictory accounts of what Leonard's actions had been. And based on the timing of when police were called, 8.30 a.m. per police files, the idea that Leonard called the police immediately upon discovering Johnny was missing does not hold water. Sarah spent most of her time on the Johnny Gosh investigation believing that Sam Soda was suspect, and rightfully so. Then, after talking to him, she uncritically believed every word he said and came to believe that he was the honest one who Noreen had to fame. All of this despite the fact that his interview was full of red flags, a false statement that the Goshes hired him when it was the other way around, a dubious assertion Eugene Martin's kidnapping was unconnected, an even, well, how would, even, how would he even know if it was or wasn't connected? An even more dubious attempt to dissuade Sarah from her Millhouse theory, and claim Johnny's kidnapping wasn't premeditated, an odd assertion that the county attorney's office gave him a blessing to show child pornography in public, and an attempt to stop Sarah from seeking out witness Mary Bach, who he had just claimed would corroborate his story on Frank Sikora. Not surprisingly, because when Sarah did interview Bach, she contradicted Sam. Wow, that's weird. So he's so Sam Soda's like, oh yeah, the Frank Sikora thing, Mary Bach can... Uh, can uh, can corroborate the story, but by the way, don't seek her out to actually have her do that. She can, but don't talk to her and actually do that. <laughs> That's kind of weird. All right, continuing the post here, do you really think this is a legitimate way to go about investigating a case? It's one thing to change your mind, but Sarah immediately fell head over heels for any new fact that arrived in front of her, no matter if the fact was of highly dubious providence or failed to answer legitimate questions or concerns that she had previously raised on the podcast. As such, there really wasn't a fair consideration of different theories at all. By the time of Leonard and Sam Soda's interviews, the podcast was incredibly one-sided, accepting these anti-Noreen accounts with no criticism and making unfounded arguments against the Franklin theory. Hell, it got to the point, see season 1 episode 22, where it was debunking Paul Bonacci which in with incredibly bizarre claims like using Chris Baird to deny that Johnny had a stammer when upset even though Johnny's own mother said that he did. I mean, it would be curious to see also what his brother and sister said about his stutter and other friends and family members. I mean, you can't just trust one source. I mean, that's definitely an issue. It's for reasons like this that I feel it occasionally attempts to defend Noreen are just a way of deflecting from how awfully the podcast treated her. When you're using the word of a neighborhood boy who was at best an acquaintance of Johnny to dispute his mother's observation of Johnny's behavior, I don't think that represents having much respect for Noreen. They gave Leonard a platform to accuse Noreen of falling for a con man and later being delusional enough to accuse him of burying Johnny in their basement. What? 
All the while, none of the serious contradictions in Leonard's story were addressed, even though I repeatedly told Sarah about them. Sam Soto was given an opportunity to do the same, expressing how sorry he felt for Noreen's loss while accusing her of making up the claims against him. And once again, it was never acknowledged that Sam had essentially no credibility whatsoever. Sarah may have been limited in how much she herself went after Noreen, but if you give non-credible witnesses a platform to do so and make the audience think they are credible by withholding the problems with their stories, you are effectively complicit in a smear. If anything, given how Sarah simultaneously maintains that Noreen has all her wits about her, and that Noreen has falsely accused people like Leonard and Sam, it seems like she's hinting to the audience that Noreen is not delusional, but in fact a willful liar. And again, this is another good time to reiterate the Mind Shock motto. I do not allege anything is true or untrue. I do not claim anyone is lying or telling the truth. This is Mind Shock, where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. Here's another post by Marion number one. I couldn't say that there is any outright smoking gun because if there were, the case would be unequivocally solved already. But the patchwork of circumstantial evidence regarding Johnny's case and Paul Bonacci's claims make the Franklin theory by far the most likely explanation. Well before Bonacci came forward, the evidence pointed to Johnny surviving months, if not years, after his kidnapping, which rules out most kidnapper motives other than human trafficking. Most compelling are a 1983 Oklahoma sighting of Johnny and a $1985 bill with a message signed by Johnny and matched to Johnny's handwriting. So on the face of it, even without getting into the Franklin evidence, child trafficking already seems to be what happened to Johnny, making it far more likely than a that a theory like Franklin is the truth. Also, if you believe Noreen's statements about Johnny calling the house, so she spoke to him at least one occasion, but, I mean, has she ever been brain fingerprint scanned? Because I think that would convince a lot of people too. I mean, I talk about the brain fingerprint scan technology. This is not like a polygraph. It completely bypasses any intention to deceive or tell the truth. It simply measures brain wave recognition of information being presented. This is what's used by the military. There's a $150,000 reward for anybody who can beat it. Supposedly no one has beat it before. And uh, this is what Stephen Avery took of making a murderer fame, where he did not recognize any of the information that the, the prosecution alleges uh, was involved with the, uh, the murder of Teresa Hallback. So everybody's still alive in this case. I mean, that's just a major tool, brain fingerprint scan technology. It should be used in all these cases. Just to remove all doubt. Although it is often suggested that Bonacci decided to link himself to the Johnny Gosh story while in prison, his claims predate that. Bonacci's diary made reference to a September 1982 incident in which he was taken to an Iowa farmhouse by Emilio and saw a Des Moines boy named Johnny fitting Johnny Gosh's description held captive there. This is reprinted on page 107 of Why Johnny Can't Come Home by Noreen Gosh. The diaries were stored at Bonacci's grandmother's house during his time in prison, so he did not have access to them. Interesting. Page 244 of the Franklin Scandal by Nick Bryan. And a forensic ink analyst of the diary on January 14th, 1991, found no evidence that any diary entry was written more than 1.5 years prior, which predates Bonacci's incarceration. Curious. Bonacci's story included numerous accurate and pertinent facts that were not known publicly. His account of the kidnappers showing a photograph of Johnny matched with the then unreleased information that Johnny was photographed a couple weeks prior to his kidnapping, which both Noreen and her then husband have confirmed. His mention of the kidnappers using multiple vehicles beyond just the car seen by the paper drop witnesses matched the also non-public at the time information about a suspicious van being seen in the neighborhood, which was first alleged by Noreen and then inadvertently confirmed by Chris Burge. It's funny because he's like, I didn't see it, but it was at, but was it at the intersection? The van that was supposedly at the intersection? I didn't see it. <laughs> Bonacci even implicated Sam Soda, who had been an unrevealed suspect of the Gosh's prior to Bonacci coming forward. 
Also powerful is how Bonacci claimed that a Sioux City area farmhouse owned by a man named Charlie was used as a holding facility for Johnny and other kids in the trafficking ring, when in fact there was a pedophile farmhouse owner near Sioux City named Charlie Kerr, whom Bonacci ended up identifying per Noreen's account. Bonacci, in my view, knew too much that he had no reasonable way of knowing unless he truly was involved in the child trafficking ring and involved with Johnny Gosh. And while it is hearsay, former Franklin investigator Robert Hansel told me that the Franklin Ring victims other than Bonacci mentioned encountering Johnny Gosh as well. Now, here is another major mind shock, if true. So check out this post by Truly Woke over just over a week ago. Well, first of all, Paul Bonacci is the stepbrother of one of John Wayne Gacy's victims. Many young boys worked for John Wayne Gacy, but one of which was Philip R. Pask. Philip Pask assisted a man named John D. Norman in the Delta Project, which was basically a pedophilia child trafficking organization which facilitated clients across the continent. This can help back up Paul Bonacci's claims about him being part of a human trafficking ring. The reason why the media isn't saying much about the Gacy connections is because many of the clients of the Delta Project were law enforcement officials, politicians, and elite individuals who have the power to cover this stuff up. We also can't forget about many different victims and witnesses who've come forward about conspiring with one another and have said that they've been sexually abused by these corrupt elites involved in the cover-up. We assume that our government isn't involved in harming others because they're meant to protect and serve, but clearly we've been mistaken. Sometimes the truth is crazier than fiction. So the last rabbit hole we're going to go down here is the Delta Project. This is also by Truly Woke 111. Someone also posted here the reason paper boys were targeted is they have an exact route. So they have a predictable movement. Curious. So one of Gacy's victims, Timothy McCoy, Paul Bonacci was the stepbrother of him. This led me to do some research on the John Wayne Gacy case, and I made the recent discovery that Philip R. Pask, a man who assisted John D. Norman in the Delta Project, worked for John Wayne Gacy's PDM Contractors, a company John Wayne Gacy owned. What a coincidence. The Delta Project was a pedophilia child trafficking organization which facilitated clients across the continent. After two child pornographers were arrested in Chicago, 50 to 100,000 index cards containing information about clients and victims were confiscated by law enforcement officials. It's said that these index cards were confiscated and classified due to law enforcement officials, politicians, and elite individuals being involved in some way. And the last podcast on the left had a write-up on this Wow, a lot of crazy stuff. And on the last podcast on the left regarding John Norman, the Delta Project, a cover-up of a giant trafficking network, and the accomplices of John Wayne Gacy. I mean, these rabbit holes just keep on coming. I mean, this is crazy stuff. We can connect the Delta Project to the Franklin Child Prostitution Ring through Paul Bonacci's claims. Uh, so in, 19, in June 1978, Chicago police officers seized tens of thousands of these index cards from Norman's apartment. During an interview by Ted Gunderson, Franklin victim Paul Bonacci mentioned being abused by a Chicago school teacher named Joe Reynolds, who procured children for a nationwide boy prostitution network. The man in Chicago who ran the child prosecution ring kept a pink collection of file cards listing customers and the kinds of boys they liked. When the man who had a history of sex offenses against children was once again arrested, law enforcement discovered his file cards. Bonacci recounted being in the apartment where the file cards were kept performing administrative tasks for the network. According to Bonacci, two names that showed up in the file cards were Alan Baer and Harold Anderson, both implicated in the Franklin case. Based on the location in Chicago, the timing of Bonacci's abuse, late 70s, early 80s, the description of the man in charge of the network, and the nature of the file cards, their color and information they contained, it is extremely likely that the man was John Norman. That would indicate that multiple Franklin abusers purchased boys from Norman's operation. I mean, this is just, I mean, this is just crazy. Another thing relating to Pask 
Tony, one of the individuals involved in Johnny Gosh's abduction, is, sus is suspected to be Philip Pask. According to Paul Bonacci, Tony was a tall man, had long hair, had acne scars on his face, and would also dress up as a woman. According to witnesses at the Johnny Gosh abduction scene, he was described as a tall, stocky man seen walking behind Johnny while he walked away from the paper drop. These two photos are the only ones I could find. He is six feet tall, just like Paul Bonacci claims. He, he is, was a child trafficker who worked for a human trafficking organization connected to the Franklin child prostitution ring. Dressed up like a woman, just like, just like Paul Bonacci claims. He also had long blonde hair, just like Paul Bonacci claims, blue eyes, and was thin. Not only does Philip Paske match Paul's description, but he also matches the description of Michaela Garrett's kidnapper. Witnesses at the Michaela Garrett abduction scene described the abductor as following white male in his 20s, seen with several acne or pockmarks on his face, shoulder length, dirty blonde hair, around six feet in height, and had a slender build, fox-like blue eyes, almost all of which match the descriptions of Tony and Philip Pask. At the time of Michaela Garrett's abduction, he would have been 35 years old, so mid-30s, this can easily be explained due to the fact that acne can occur well into your 30s, 40s, and even 50s. He may have also had a younger appearance like many men in their early to mid-30s. The Local Pedophilia Human Trafficking in Des Moines Disclaimer, I've discussed this possibility before on previous posts, but I'm going to reiterate it so I can match the information that I've recently discovered. There are two variations of this theory, but both are ultimately the same, but a little different in their own way. Variation one, Johnny Gosh's father, Leonard John Gosh, could have contacted the Franklin Child Prostitution Ring and sold his son into it. And due to human trafficking being a widespread network that operates globally, meaning that all local trafficking ring cults and criminal organizations that are involved in human trafficking have to remain interconnected in order to successfully traffic individuals from one place to another. So it is possible that people from the Franklin Child Prostitution Ring could have had connections with people in one of the local Des Moines human trafficking pedophilia rings and used them in assistance in Johnny's kidnapping. This can explain Sam Soda's involvement and how he knew about Eugene's kidnapping before it happened. Variation two, there were many pedophiles who worked for the Des Moines Register, two of which being, okay, also new names, numbers, paper routes, and addresses, and were giving it out to people within the ring. Then it's possible they could have used this information to put Johnny on the market where he was then sold to the Franklin Child Prostitution Ring. After he initially was sold, I believe that Paul Bonacci and Emilio were sent to assist Sam Soda and Tony, possibly Philip Pask, in Johnny Gosh's abduction. I believe that this variation is more plausible considering the fact that Eugene Martin and later Mark Allen disappeared under similar circumstances. I believe that the Des Moines local human trafficking ring could have sold Eugene Martin and Mark Allen to different buyers who less known than the people who purchased Johnny. Many of the Franklin victims are still unknown, so Eugene Martin and Mark Allen being sold to Franklin, the Franklin ring, is still a possibility. Ultimately, both variations follow the same theory that a smaller local human trafficking ring worked with Franklin ring in order to abduct Johnny and possibly others. Variation 2 also supports the yellow bag's experiences and the idea that a local ring could have been trying to abduct and traffic others. Remember that Des Moines is still a big city and child prostitution was a big thing back then. The Delta Project also points out how they would recruit young boys as prostitutes and would pimp them out to customers or clients. Disclaimer, ultimately this is just a theory and I don't want anybody to think that I'm spreading false information to people and feeding them as true. I'm still doing more research and will update everyone. The more info I find about Johnny Gosh, Franklin, and anything connected to it. So, wow. I mean, the rabbit holes run deep. What do all the Mind Shock listeners think about all of this so far? I mean, it's kind of hard to ignore all of these coincidences and bizarre oddities. I mean, there's just so many of them and corroborating evidence. 